Welcome to Austin Community College and to the spring 2021 Great Questions Lecture. Uh, the goal of our Great Questions project at Austin Community College is to enable our students to complete core curriculum courses in a discussion-based environment uh, focused on the study of transformative texts and led by faculty who are passionate about our students' success. Uh, each semester, we invite students, uh, we, each semester, we invite uh, speakers to engage with us who can help our community become more thoughtful about the texts we read and the questions provoked by reading them. This spring, I have the privilege of welcoming and introducing Dr. Emily Wilson. Emily is a professor in the Department of Classical Studies and chair of the program in comparative literature and literary theory at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of a great many books and the classics editor of the revised Norton Anthology of World Literature. Her translations are works of great beauty and have helped many students explore ancient texts more deeply and productively, especially Homer's Odyssey, which is the focus of her talk this morning, 10 Reasons to Read Homer in 2021. The format of the webinar uh, this morning is uh, Emily is going to speak to us um, uh, for, 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 for a while, and then we'll have lots of time for a question and answer. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Emily, uh, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Um, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. And thank you for inviting me. It's a real honor to talk to you. Um, I'm going to share my screen so I can set up PowerPoint if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, yes, I think, I think it's working, right? Um, okay, so I'm just gonna, um, and, I, and I, I thank you again also for rescheduling this. I know it's been a really hard time in Texas. Um, I live in Philadelphia where we've had a huge amount of snow, but it hasn't caused the kind of damage that I know it has for you guys. Um, so my talk is gonna include a um, short preamble about the timelessness or timeliness of ancient poems, um, because I was asked to talk about the relevance of Homer, reading Homer now, or reading Homer um, as a timeless text, and so I sort of wanted to engage with that question of whether it's timely or timeless. Then I'm going to do a brief discussion of my goals as a translator or retranslator of the much translated um, Homeric poems, as I knew you guys have read my translation of the Odyssey. And then I'm going to go through seven rather than 10 Homeric themes that feel to me particularly resonant at this moment, 2021, in the United States. Um, so I'm doing seven rather than 10 because I want to make sure I'm leaving enough time for questions. And I realize if I do 10, I'm just going to go on too long. I'm going to end with a very short taster of my in-progress translation of the Iliad. And then I hope, hope we'll have lots of time for q and I'd love to hear from as many of you as possible. Okay, so my first, um, first section of my talk, I just want to do, do a preamble about timeliness or timelessness. Um, I think it's a common idea that the quote unquote greatest works of world literature somehow transcend time and space. Uh, to me, that seems a slightly problematic or maybe deeply problematic framework. Um, you might think the reasons to read and engage with the great books, such as Homer, in the United States in 2021 would be exactly the same reasons that you would always have wanted to engage with Homer, exactly the same as the reasons these poems were performed and read and listened to in all kinds of other cultural moments in different places. They would represent experiences that all human beings go through. They're about life, death, family, change, community, conflict. There's no human culture that doesn't engage with these issues. I think all that's true. Um, but I also think once we look at a more fine grained level, universal experiences feel very different and are experienced and represented differently in different human cultures. And the cultural difference really matters. That's part of why the humanities matter, because that's the area of study in which we examine the details of cultural difference. Particular cultural artifacts don't have universal relevance for all cultures and all people in exactly the same way, because there's so much diversity within and between cultures. Appeals to timelessness, I think sometimes entail um, unexamined reinforcement of biases, as well as false homogenization of history. The Odyssey isn't inherently more universal than the Ramayana or the works of Confucius or any other great work of pre-modern world literature. Ancient texts, like modern ones, mean different things to different people around the world and even in a single moment, in a single culture, in a single classroom. Presumably part of what you learn in seminar is your classmates may have different perspectives, even on a single line. 
if we want to learn about the distant past, we also have to be willing, I think, to, to examine ourselves and our own culture and to be aware, aware of the specificities of what we bring to a particular text, the insights that our particular cultural moment affords and precludes. So just a couple of historical um, details to back up the claim that Homer hasn't always been read the same way, even in modern English speaking cultures. Um, I'm a fairly recent translator of Homer. Homer wasn't translated into English until 400 years ago, which if you think about it, it's really late. Um, the earliest translations into English were, were by a dramatist called George Chapman. Um, there were many, many centuries in which almost nobody was reading these poems. And that wasn't just because people lost knowledge of ancient Greek. It was also because they seemed so distant. They didn't seem timely and resonant. The particular cultural meanings of the Odyssey, when it has been read, have been very, very varied. Derek Walcott's Odyssey is not the same as Milton's Odyssey. Chapman's Homer, so I just mentioned the first translator into English, his version is very much informed by his particular cultural interests, the interests of Elizabethan Jacobean England. His Odysseus um, is very much an Elizabethan gentleman. So Chapman lived at the, at the time of Shakespeare. The, he makes a Homer that's about the relationship of royal and parliamentary power, issues that were very important in the politics and society of his time, and about private versus public forms of violence and revenge. Chapman's um, Odyssey, in a way, is a pilgrim's progress. His Achilles is like an alienated courtier. If you go forward a couple of hundred years, Alexander Pope's Homer speaks to an entirely different set of cultural concerns. It's an enlightenment reading. It's, his Homer is about civility, reason, passion, good manners and control. My Homer is different from either one of those. And I don't think that's because they misread it and I got it right. I think it's because what I'm bringing to the poem because of my cultural moment as well as myself is different. Scholars, translators, teachers, and students, I think need to, need to approach ancient literature or the great books with as much awareness as possible, both of distant um, cultural worlds, of the, the worlds from which they emerged, and also the specific preoccupations and questions that are generated by our own time and place. Every new cultural moment generates a new vantage point to see something different in alien cultures. So moving on to my goals as a translator. In my experience as a reader of translated literature, when I'm trying to read books in all the many, many languages, the majority of languages in the world, I don't know. I want to still have access to that literature. When I read, read literature in translation, um, I feel frustrated by translations whose, whose authors are trying to produce, quote, the truth or just the truth, something direct about what the foreign text is saying or doing. I think if, you, if the translator says that or thinks of it that way, the result is very often flat or lifeless language. If you think it's straightforward to do translation, that probably means you haven't thought enough about your own uses of language or about which particular truths out of the many truths you could tell about the original, do you most want to tell? Which truths feel most alive for your text? Given that the Homeric poems, when I started the, um, my version of the Odyssey, when I started working on that, uh, I guess now seven or eight years ago, they'd already been translated almost 70 times into English alone, let alone other languages. I didn't think it was worthwhile for me to do it all over again, unless I felt I could bring something that was both genuinely new and in some way or other responsible to what's happening in the original. I was motivated to try doing this, because I felt there were certain limitations in most modern English versions of these poems, interpretative and stylistic choices that seem to be not wrong, but debatable. They're choices, which in some cases felt so ingrained in American English readers' perceptions of what English Homer, quote unquote, should sound like, that it was hard, it was hard to recognize that these were choices. So I wanted to, be, wanted to show this is a choice, you could do it differently. So that includes the tendency to use either prose or non-metrical free verse, which is a really dominant choice in 20th century translations of not just Homer, but other metrical ancient poetry, despite the fact that the original is an entirely regular metrical poem designed to be experienced by illiterate audiences orally performed out loud. Um, Greek speakers of the period these poems were produced 
didn't have reading and writing or it wasn't widespread when these poems were produced. The effects of the poem are fundamentally dependent on sound. There's a very regular rhythm that goes all the way through. That sound is the heartbeat. So I, I felt there was something missing in translations which weren't very regular metrically. There was also a tendency to use obscure, peculiar or non-idiomatic English as if to honor the, honor the poem's antiquity. Even though the original poems are very simple and straightforward in their syntax, again, they're designed to be easily understandable when performed out loud. They're not designed for you to need the footnotes. So I used iambic pentameter, which I see as the English equivalent of dactylic hexameter in Greek, to try to invite the reader to read out loud, to think about rhythm, to think about sound. I alliterated a lot as well, just to try and think of, have the reader be thinking about the sound of words. I also was aware from teaching, the, teaching these poems in translation that students sometimes seemed bored in the ways that I found surprising. So I thought, these poems are so exciting, they're so fast paced. And then I realized part of the problem is the translation is slower than the original. So I made myself um, keep to the same number of lines for the Odyssey as the original has to try and keep that quick pace so that you don't have time to get bored. You want to hear what happened in the next line. I also saw um, in other English translations a tendency to use grandiloquent, often Latinate, not, not Greekate, um, language echoing specifically Anglophone perceptions, maybe um, formed as much by Walt Whitman as by Milton, of what epic language, a grandiose macho language should sound like. And a maybe related habit um, of focalizing events when possible through an elite male perspective. So that the narrator in many translations seems to express disapproval or distance from characters in any other social category. If it's not the elite man, then we disapprove of them. So for instance, by calling the indigenous person whom Odysseus meets in the cave, um, the Cyclops calling him, quote, a monster. Of course, he is people, which isn't great, but he is, he is not characterized as something other than human. He's an anthropos, a human being. Or, by calling the enslaved women who are hanged by Telemachus, quote, creatures or sluts, which many, many English translations do. There isn't an equivalent to that in the Greek. I think it's part of a pattern of distancing us from characters who aren't the elite men. I think those stylistic and interpretative tendencies are shaped as much by specific cultural preoccupations of 20th century North America about attitudes towards war, heroism, the desire for superheroes um, that are specific to our culture and aren't actually a necessary feature of, of any reading of Homer. These poems to me seem to be very highly attuned to ethical social complexity and the, the diversity of different characters' voice and point of view. So for me as a translator, it was very important that I came to these poems to the task of translating Homer, having already done a lot of work on tragedy and a lot of um, and translations of tragedy of dramatic works, which have multiple different speakers. And I very much wanted to bring to the task of translating Homer an attunement to, there were multiple voices, multiple perspectives. These poems are produced by multiple people in a long folk tradition. I don't want it all to be about one person. I want there to be a diverse society that's fully represented in the translation in the way that I see it being represented in the Greek. Um, I also wanted to show something of the subtlety and depth of the emotional engagement of these poems and their awareness of the complexity of relationships between people. I want they wanted those qualities to emerge in some way more visibly, more audibly for students and general readers in my translations than I felt it was, was working for me in the classroom with my students with other translations. Um, I think translators in general have to have huge amounts of both humility and courage. We need to remember we can't replicate the original. A translation, no matter how you do it, is not the same as the original. We shouldn't be hubristic enough to think we can. We also need to be brave to think, but to take on the enormous responsibility of deciding, this is what I'm gonna say. I'm not gonna somehow hedge and say 10 different things at once. I'm gonna try and make my own words come to life and commit in some way to what, what they say. I wanted my translations to activate new kinds of engagement and a new awareness of the vividness, rhythmicality, um, polyphony, beauty, and emotional, ethical, social complexity that I see as there in the Homeric poems. 
So now I'm going to move on to my seven themes, um, which, all of which I see as particularly resonant for our particular cultural moment. So my first one, um, so these are my seven themes. My first one is going to be leadership. So we've just come through one of the most contested presidential elections in the country's history, and one that's cast doubt on the laws and norms by which leaders get appointed in this country. In working on the Iliad during this time, I'm constantly struck by the way these poem, the poem's themes feel almost too familiar as well as too far away. It's, it's a, the Iliad is a poem about a crisis of leadership, and it explores how a team or a community can work together in this time of, of massive partisanship, of the quarrel, when leaders are more obsessed with their own celebrity than the good of the team. And there are, in the Iliad, as I think in our culture, inconsistent visions about what the norms or the rules of the game should be. Do leaders lead by gaining consensus or persuading their opponents or by wielding superior force or by being richer? What exactly are the, are the bases of power? Can they sidestep all the options I just laid out by clever manipulation of rhetoric, storytelling, self-promotion and lies? Odysseus's leadership style is in this category. He successfully persuades his subordinates, whom he consistently, cleverly calls his friends, to escort him to Troy and back so he can enrich himself and shore up his own power. None of the so-called friends get home again. As he plans the attack on the suitors of his wife, Odysseus, on the advice of Athena, relies heavily on clever manipulation, distortion, and withholding of information. Words and images, the creation of a story, are as crucial to the final massacre in Book 22 as the spears and arrows. The Odyssey allows for multiple different perspectives. This is picking up what I just said before about the importance of seeing from more than one point of view in this poem. There are multiple perspectives on this style of leadership. We are very much invited to root for Odysseus as an underdog, we can see his disguises and deceits as a kind of code switching. They're a necessary tool for survival in shifting environments. He's constantly in a different place. He has to be someone else. From a li listener or reader perspective, there's something really fun about, about being in the company of a trickster. It's that there's no coincidence that all around the world, trickster stories are really popular. We get to feel smart in our privileged access to the schemes of Athena and her favorite human. There's a particular literary pleasure in the in the meta, meta story element. Um, this is this long, implausible story about a long con whose plot depends on the protagonist's ability to tell stories and to tell lies, as the narrator is also doing, presumably. On the other hand, the narrative also makes clear it is this ability to lie and scheme and manipulate reality might potentially be a negative. We see, the, see as in this passage here, the resentment of the crew members at the leader's failure to share either material or social rewards of the journey, or to share crucial information with them. They open the bag of winds, having been not been told what is in this bag. They want to get some share of the loot with disastrous resu results. We share this journey with him, but we come back home with empty hands. Odysseus's leadership, once he gets to Ithaca, um, damages the community in it, on, it, on, on the island, which is left at the end of the poem on the brink of civil war. Not everybody in Homer relishes the multiverse of alternative facts. Remember that in the, um, in the underworld, Achilles says he hates like the gates of Hades, the man who says one thing and hides another in his heart. And who is that but Odysseus? Okay, my second um, theme is home or, and homecoming. I'm sure you've taught a lot in class about home and nostos, the Greek word for the journey home. Both the Iliad and the Odyssey are about home, about communities of belonging, how they form, who gets included, who gets excluded. The Odyssey is about Odysseus's journey home. Um, the pain we get, we get from this, the word nostalgia, the pain of not being at home, as if home is a time as well as a place. Odysseus reaches Ithaca right in the middle of the poem in book 13 out of 24. So home, homecoming and being at home are not just geographical. His homecoming is not at all complete halfway through. Homecoming turns out to include a sequence of recognitions. So Odysseus arrives not only at a place, but at a self or set of selves. He has to become again or differently the father of Telemachus, the enslaver of Eumaeus, the enslaver of Eurycleia, the husband of Penelope, the son of Laertes, the guy who used to hunt with the dog Argos, 
the King of Ithaca, all these roles get, get reformed. And that's part, of, that's part of what constitutes coming home. The poem presents the homecoming of Odysseus as a triumph for him. At the same time, it shows that homecoming is, is preserved for the privileged few. Only gods who live forever on Mount Olympus can be sure of always having a home to come back to after they swoop down to interfere in the lives of mortals. As we've just seen, none of the men who row Odysseus to Troy and back come home. They're all eaten or drowned on the way. None of Penelope's suitors survive her husband's homecoming. Other characters are permanently homeless, like Iris the beggar, whom I'll talk about more in a second. Others, like the enslaved characters, are treated as elements in the wealth of their enslaver's home, rather than having their own place of belonging. Having a home of your own is an enormous privilege in the world of Homer, just as it is in our country right now, um, where millions of people have experienced eviction or homelessness, where there's a huge crisis about who gets to have a permanent home. Many inhabitants of this country, including many who were born here, never feel fully at home in America. After living here for over 20 years, I was actually born, I was born in the UK, as you may have picked up from my accent. I feel more or less at home here, um, rather than in the country of my birth. But I know that my comfort is largely premised on my economic and racial privilege. I would connect that to, to how Odysseus, in disguise as a homeless old migrant, asks the enslaved swineherd Eumaeus to tell his life story. And we learn that Eumaeus's journey to Ithaca was in the opposite direction in a way from that of Odysseus. They both come to Ithaca, but what that means is totally different for the two of them. Eumaeus came to the island of Ithaca as a little child when he was trafficked into slavery and deprived forever of his home. Laertes bought me with his wealth. That was the way my eyes first saw this land. The Odyssey is centrally about home and communities of belonging, but it shows us how different those can be in different places and how the same place can be totally different for one person versus another. One person's homecoming is another's journey of permanent exclusion from the privilege of home. So this takes us also to my next theme, which is Xenia, or the idealized relationship of guests, hosts, and strangers. Forced migration or, and more or less voluntary immigration, the dangers of more stable populations responding to demographic changes with xenophobia, prejudice attachment to autocratic leaders, the dream of a pluralist multicultural society, all of that, is, uh, all of that cluster of things are central issues in the world today, not just in the US. The Homeric poems emerged from a period in world culture that was in some ways analogous to our time of globalization. It was a time of cultures opening up to other cultures. Greek speakers in the late eighth century BCE didn't have a unified nation or a unified dialect, but they had a new information sharing technology, the alphabet, um, just as we have a new information sh sharing technology in the internet. Um, and they were beginning a rapid pro process of trade, travel, and colonization enabled by new shipbuilding techniques. They were founding settlements far away from mainland Greece, all over neighboring islands and coasts in places like Sicily and Asia Minor. The Homeric poems emerged from that period of expansion from your own tiny little island all around the world to where or the known world to, to Greek speakers in that period. In which, Greek, in which Greek speakers and non-Greeks were interacting. The poem is engaging with, what does that mean? Perhaps the most important concept in the Odyssey is xenia, from which we get xenophobia and the less, sadly less common xenophilia, the love of strangers. A xenos in Greek is either a stranger, a ghost, a host or, or a guest. It's somebody who's not part of your kinship group, your family, your tribe, but has the potential to be welcomed into your house. Is somebody that you're not going to slaughter or enslave. The idealized relationship of guests and host, hosts is blessed by Zeus. He's the god who looks out for strangers. Xenia provides a way of imagining how people from different households, different cultures, could form intimate bonds with each other and interact without killing or enslaving each other. In some ways, it's an inspiring ideal for how wealthy modern nations could think about migrants and refugees and a, a diverse population. What if we just welcomed everybody in and hosted everybody with an awareness that there's a reciprocal advantage to that arrangement, that if you let somebody into your house, they let you into your house, into their house too. 
The poem returns obsessively to scenes of welcome and hosting and to variations on that, including different ways the relationship of guests and hosts can go horribly wrong. Odysseus's various divine, magical or monstrous hosts on his journey home from Troy provide each different variations on the norms of hospitality. Many of those variations can be seen as expressing anxiety that visiting somewhere else, being intimate with somebody from a different culture might mean losing your own cult cultural identity, being literally eaten up by somebody from a different culture. Calypso provides Odysseus with everything a guest would want except power and the means to get back home. Several of the magical hosts devour the guests. The host's task is to feed the guest. The cannibal host is this inversion, um, the threat of cu cultural assimilation in a foreign world. Are people who live differently, whose cultures, whose food might be different from ours, are they necessarily monstrous? Could they just be different? I think the Odyssey suggests complex and maybe incoherent answers to that question. The culture of the Cyclops Island is weird from an agrarian Greek perspective. The Cyclops people are pastoral, they live in the mountains, they don't seem to grow grain. But the Cyclops, as I said before, is also a human being and he has divine heritage. He seems to be living a quiet life eating cheese before the colonizing Greek invades his home. The poem seems then to acknowledge both the state that, that this is an ideal location, that the idea of hosting is a wonderful ideal, but also it's very dangerous. The host or the guest could each be threats to each other. Once Odysseus returns to Ithaca, his wife's suitors are his monstrous hosts in his own house. Odysseus himself becomes, like the Cyclops, the worst kind of host, the kind that slaughters the uninvited guest rather than feeding them. The poem prompts us to ask what you're allowed to do, what's legitimate if migrants or refugees or immigrants or just strange people enter your house uninvited, what's okay? Can you slaughter them? Can you say that was justice? What's the cost to doing that in terms of the community, like the fathers and brothers who fight in book 24 for their dead sons? Is there a way to avoid having your place taken over by strangers, but also avoid an escalation of violence? Is, there, is it actually a bad thing to be in a strange place? Might that be okay? Now we're moving on to number four, inequality, which is which, by which I mean that there can be diversity of privilege within a society, not just difference between societies. For much of the second half of the Odyssey, Odysseus is in disguise as a ragged old beggar. He's mistreated by Penelope's suitors who disobey the norms of Xenia by rejecting a potential guest. On one level, the poem seems to suggest there's an ab absolute obligation to take care of strangers in need. It shows that the suitors are bad, that they're hurling things at their, um, their impoverished guest. But this obligation only operates for a certain specific category of people, those who might look like genuine homeless people, but they're actually elite warriors or, like Athena, goddesses in disguise. You can see the poem's ideological tensions in the depiction of Iris, the career beggar, who in book, book 18 is contrasted with Odysseus, the fake homeless person. They, they wrestle and Odysseus beats, beats Iris up and humiliates him and is rewarded significantly with an animal stomach. So the fight is about the belly, it's about hunger and about which kinds of hunger, which kinds of need or want are legitimate and which kinds are okay to, to other, to exclude from the house. It's about class as well as poverty. Odysseus's hunger for honor and a name and power is valorized by the narrative, even though it, like the hunger of Iris, is ultimately based on material food. It's based on the animals. Um, there are two, two kinds of homeless or migrant person representing two entirely contradictory notions about how to deal with what, if this is a realistic poem, would be the same population. I think there are similar complexities in the Odyssey's confused account, richly confused, I think imagination, imaginative confusion can be really useful for thinking with, of the quote unquote right or wrong way to be enslaved. I think there's a bizarre suggestion in this poem that it's the ethical responsibility of enslaved people rather than, as, as you might think, the enslavers to get the relationship right. Eumaeus, the enslaved swineherd, presents Odysseus in disguise with good hospitality showing that even an enslaved person can be morally better than the rude, um, posh suitors. But on the other hand, Eumaeus's story shows he's from an originally aristocratic background. 
And the quote unquote good slaves are the ones who haven't always been enslaved. Maybe it can happen to anyone, but only elite, elite slaves or refugees from an elite household are quote unquote good enough to fulfill the role in a way that's beneficial to the enslaver. In contrast to Melantho and Melanthius, the black flower enslaved people who are claimed by the wrong enslavers, the suitors. I think all that complexity echoes current discussions that we have in our country at this, at this time about racial inequality and economic inequality, which center, I think, on whether there's a meaningful distinction between deserving and undeserving poor people. Okay, number five um, is empathy. Um, we've seen during the pandemic how the impacts of, um, of disaster um, are felt much more deeply in some communities than others. And I think it's a time when many, many people are asking, us, are asking ourselves whether people in positions of power are capable of feeling true empathy for the experiences of those in different social worlds from their own. Homer's narrative in both Homeric poems constantly shifts from one point of view to another. We seem to see the same events, such as we've seen for Odysseus's homecoming, not from one perspective, but many perspectives. Even in times of intimacy and connection, the narrative is always conscious of fine-grained distinctions between perspectives and between access to power. There's a deep awareness how, of how people can be close and distant at the same time. So we see this, for instance, we could go to many different places for this, um, in the great reunion scene in which Odysseus and Penelope finally acknowledge each other as husband and wife. Uh, you'll remember, for, or I'm sure you've discussed how there's an ambiguity about when does Penelope recognize that Odysseus, the homeless old guy who slaughtered the suitors, actually is her husband? When exactly does that cognitive shift happen? And how does she, she maintain some level of control about defining how they, how they reunite. In that great scene, I think we see Odysseus' perspective and his perspective centering specifically on the item of furniture, the bed, which for him represents his fear and his anger, his threat that his wife might have slept with someone else over the course of the 20 years that he's been abandoning her, that his supposedly immovable bed could have been moved. In fact, it could have been moved. His control over his own domestic environment could might be not total. At the same time, we glimpse her point of view. She uses plural pronouns for their marriage, where he uses very insistently the first person singular. In my translation, I very much wanted to, to, to allow the reader to notice how often he says I, 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 whereas she doesn't, she says we. The bed, which he defines as an object created by his own ingenious, I'm so smart self, is for her an object defined by absence and tears. The same piece of furniture represents power for one person and powerlessness for another. The wonderful final simile shows this slippage between perspectives. At first we may think it's about a shipwreck, it's got to be about Odysseus, but it's not, it's about her. Um, as welcome as the land to swimmers when Poseidon wrecks their ship at sea and breaks it with great waves and driving winds. A few escape the sea and reach the shore, their skin all caked with brine. Grateful to be alive, they crawl to land. So glad she was to see her own dear husband and her white arms would not let go his neck. So there, it makes their experiences seem on some level similar. They're both survivors of shipwreck. They're desperate. They're both clinging to each other as if for dear life. Their survival depends on each other, but they're also not the same at all. Her metaphorical shipwreck was caused by him. So my sixth um, theme is rage and shame, the interrelationship of rage and, and shame. This is in, in contrast to the previous theme of connection, the, the Homeric poems are as good as on conflict as connection. They suggest a complex mix of triggers, feelings and needs that drive people to kill each other. What, for instance, and I think this is a, this is a real question for people in the United States right now, what causes people to acts of massacre or acts of terrorism? On, one level, it can come down to leadership. Odysseus kills on the instructions of Athena. Telemachus kills on the orders of Odysseus. Beyond that, there are underlying economic causes. The city of Troy in the Iliad is extraordinarily rich. That's part of why the Greeks are there. In the Odyssey, Odysseus wants to regain his wealth. On another level, there are emotional causes, centering on the need which both gods and humans feel intensely in Homer for honor and respect. You want status. 
Athena wants the massacre of the suitors to be as impressive and narratively implausible as possible, so she gains maximum glory for herself. That's what drives the whole plot of the poem, is her desire for glory. Rage and insatiable aggression can bind people together in a community as they do it in book 24, when we see the three generations, Laertes, Odysseus, and Telemachus, together in a way they've never been together before because they're fighting and killing people together. It's a big bonding thing, the family that you know, kills together is still together, something like that. Um, on another level, the, um, there is rage that takes on a life of its own, as when Odysseus, right at the end of the poem, is on that killing spree, swooping like an eagle at his fellow Ithacans and has to be stopped by Athena. Killing is also motivated by the counterpart to the desire for honor, which is outrage at humiliation, like Odysseus by the suitors. Um, it's this highly gendered, as male, fear of shame that drives Telemachus in the Odyssey for his first solo killing, the slaughter of the 13 enslaved people who've been claimed by the suitors. We're shown very clearly what drives a bullied, anxious, privileged young man who keenly resents his subordination to his clever, in de facto single mother to want to close up forever the orifices of women whose bodies, memories and existence threaten his own social position. But we also glimpse the perspective of the enslaved people themselves in their vulnerability and in their desire, like the birds in the simile. You'll remember from the passage, they're like birds. They want to go home to their nests, but someone set a trap. They're caught in the net around their necks. They wanted a nostos, they wanted a homecoming, and they wanted to be able to move their feet by themselves as men can do, but women, especially enslaved people, not so much. My final theme is time, which is, which is another fourth topic in current um, United States politics. Some of the most prominent rhetoric in our time is oriented around restoring a, a particular, maybe fictional version of the past, a past of American greatness, or a past when America had soul, while others are pushing for a future which would be different from the past. Reading the Homeric poems during this time, I'm thinking about how they both frame themselves as stories about a very distant past, a world where things were different from the way things are now at the time of the story singing. They both poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, invite us to think about, can we stop time? Can we go back to a long lost past? And also, would we want to? Only gods can live in a world free from time and change. Humans are always changing, always in time. This is a description of the world of the gods, the world of Olympus. The place is never shaken by the wind or wet with rain or blanketed by snow. A cloudless sky is spread above the mountain, white radiance all round. The blessed gods live there in happiness forevermore. In a way that passage defines human life by what it's not. We are, we are always blanketed by snow and living in time. Odysseus fulfills the fantasy of turning back time and re reasserting his own stable identity across time and space, be becoming again. So it's as if he goes back in time, as, as if he's coming back in his homecoming to an earlier self, as well as to an earlier time. Um, becoming again the vigorous young man in the prime of life that presumably he was 20 years before. And magically, thanks to Athena, it succeeds. He asserts his exact same social position in his marriage, his family, his community. So we're shown if in, this, in these very unlikely circumstances, what if you actually could turn back 20 years? What if you could, you could be who you were 20 years ago? We're also shown in the Odyssey how uh, this, this process has a huge cost in terms of human life. There's a big death count in the Odyssey. The poem ends not with Odysseus back to his old self as the peaceful king of Ithaca, but back to his old self as he was in Troy, massacring op opponents on the battlefield. But this time it's at home. He's a veteran who's come home and then kills, his, kills the people at home as well as at war. The poem recognizes the limits to which anyone, even Athena, could achieve the conservative fantasy of recovering a part, partly fictional time of lost greatness. 20 years maybe are erased for Odysseus. They're not erased, as I, as I suggested a few minutes ago, for Penelope, whose face is marked by tears. She constantly talks about her face marked by tears, her bed stained with her tears. Or for Telemachus, who is no longer a baby. Or for the dog Argos, who picks up his ears at the sound of his old master's voice. Then suddenly, black death took hold of him. 20 years might be erasable 
but they're only erasable for one extraordinarily privileged man, not anybody else. I focus today on big, broad cultural themes that I think connect the Homeric poems with big, broad cultural themes that seem so resonant with our own time in 2021 in the United States. I'm aware they also, that, that the Odyssey also connects on a more personal level to different people. My own relationship with Homer has evolved and changed over the, I guess, 40 years that I've known the story. I first encountered the story of the poem when I was eight years old, um, when I played Athena in my elementary school play, as the school teachers got bored of doing the nativity every year, so we did the Odyssey instead. And it was the first time I'd sort of heard of Greek goddesses, and it was great that I got to you know, make, make my own helmet, and it was really fun. Um, and of course, my relationship with Homer has changed enormously over decades of reading these poems, rereading them, reading them in Greek. Many young readers, children as well as teenagers, can readily recognize in the Odyssey a world where ultra powerful beings, you could call them Athena, Zeus and Poseidon, or you could call them mom and dad, who are bickering with each other and you're in the middle, and, but you also have other dreams of magic and adventure and worlds elsewhere. It's a poem which speaks, I think, very deeply to that experience of childhood. Readers in teens or early 20s can often see something of themselves in Telemachus's struggles to define himself against his parents and through exploring different communities, kind of like going away to college. Um, many young people can find easy, easy points of personal connection in stories of a broken home, bullying, the need for respect and recognition, gender discrimination, betrayal, fidelity, fairness, payback, insiders and outsiders, social hierarchies, cultural difference. Lots of people are aware of the pressure to be like Odysseus, always being somebody else in a different social environment. Lots of people experience in daily life the possibility of violence and the loss of home. The Homeric focus on grief for people who die far from home, um, lacking the proper rituals of burial, seems to me much less distant on a, on a sort of visceral level after the mass casualties of the pandemic and the loss of mourning rituals that we've all been living through, um, that we can't have a, have a moment to grieve, just as you can't grieve properly in the Iliad if the people, the people die away from their homes. Many of us in lockdown may have a sing, renewed sympathy for the experience of Penelope stuck in her bedroom with her sulky kid while her husband goes zooming off all over the Mediterranean, spreading mayhem and probably viruses in his wake. So in closing, just to sum up some of the, I think I've touched on a whole bunch of different things. Um, I'm aware that students, translators, scholars, any of us who engage with Homer, we often want, like Odysseus, to create a total reconstruction of a presumably imaginary past, at least partly imaginary past. There's a brand of simplistic historicism that says you can just go back across 3000 years. You can remake these ancient poems exactly as they were experienced in their own time. We'll just get rid of the intervening time. One of, one of the main risks of that historicist um, simplistic fantasy is that it can encourage you to ignore the way our questions about the past are shaped by the preoccupation of the present, especially when we're not thinking about how that's happening. I think simplistic historicism is just as problematic a simplistic presentism that draws falsely straight lines between the past and the present. So for instance, I would hesitate to do the gesture of saying Odysseus is just like any particular modern leader. There are always differences, there's always layers. My goal in laying out possible partial resonances, not equations between themes in Homer and in our time is to suggest that both past and present might be recognized more clearly if we see them as being always in dialogue with each other. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up by reading just the first um, seven lines of my translation in progress of the Iliad. And then I would love to engage with whatever questions you guys have. Goddess, sing of the cataclysmic wrath of Peleus' son, Achilles. Su cause of so much suffering for the Greeks that sent many strong souls to Hades, making men a feast for birds and prey for dogs. The plan of Zeus was moving to its end, beginning when those two argued first, Lord Agamemnon and glorious Achilles. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up and I would love to take whatever questions you guys
what do I do? What do I do at the stage? <laughs> I just look for questions. Is that right? Okay. So, um, uh, folks, if you have questions uh, for Emily, please click on the Q and A tab, uh, which is um, uh, in between the raise hand and the live transcript, and enter your question into the Q and A. Um, I do see a question. Ah, here we go. Uh, Emily, do you find the question there? Yes, I'm not sure how much I can say about this question. Um, okay, yes, so I'm getting more, getting more questions coming in. Let me see what I can do. Okay, so um, well, the question that I'm going to address first is um, talking about um, whether there were specific aspects of recent translations, such as the translations by Stanley Lombardo, um, Robert Fagels, and Richmond Lattimore, that called out for revision in a shifted cultural moment. Um, so when I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to do a retranslation of the Odyssey, given that I was aware there were a whole bunch of translations already, I certainly thought very hard at that stage about um, whether there was already translations out there that I felt would replicate whatever I would want to do. And so I did, I did a sort of exercise as I was trying to think about whether to take on the project of rereading book nine very, very slowly in Greek, just to sort of have it absolutely clear in my mind. And then I read something like 10 translations just of that, of that book and tried to think about how might I do that differently? Would I want to do anything different from what's already out there? Um, and after doing that process, I thought, actually, I do think that there are things I would want to do differently. Um, I mean, at that stage, I wasn't necessarily thinking primarily about how can I respond to the cultural moment. My, in fact, my, my primary thing was thinking, as I, as I tried to suggest, but probably too fast, um, that I would do something different metrically. None of those translations have a very regular meter to them. And those are the dominant best-selling American translations. So, so I was conscious also from just teaching I think I've told all of those diff different bits of them in the classroom, that I felt that those, those translations gave an image to students of the language of Homer, which is which has a, a particular um, free verse poetics. Um, and I wanted to try and introduce the possibility that you can experience the rhythm of Homer in English by doing a very met metrical translation and also trying, as I suggested, to bring out the, um, the proto-dramatic elements of the poem more clearly that I felt was done in those translations. I mean, in looking at those translations, specifically of book nine, I chose that book, which is the book about the Cyclops, specifically because I was interested from my classroom experience of teaching that book um, in the house, students I thought seemed to be less attuned than I thought, I was sort of puzzled by how not attuned students were to the ways that Odysseus might or might not be an unreliable narrator. And then I thought maybe part of the reason it's difficult to be attuned to questions about narrative perspective is that the translations aren't helping you with that. So I wanted to try and think about how might a translation enable more awareness of the fluctuating narrative perspectives in the Odyssey. And it's kind of only in retrospect, I think, Maybe I'm aware of diversity of perspectives, not just because that was something I was interested in, in as a reader and critic of drama, um, but that also maybe something about the cultural moment was there. I'm not sure if it's the cultural moment for iambic pentameter. I would like it to be, but I, I'm not, that wasn't the first thing I thought about. That's something I think about in retrospect. So in, in retrospect, I, so during the five years I worked in the Odyssey translation, I didn't look at other translations while I was working on it. Um, because that just wasn't part of my process. I thought if I do that, it's just gonna be a distraction. What I want to be doing is what is engaging with the Greek and what do I want to do with the Greek? Um, so after publishing the translation, I then went, went back because um, I was curious with getting many, many people asking me, so how is your version different from Fagel's? I then thought I'm gonna try and do that experiment of just look at a passage in several different translations again, now that I have, one of the translations is by me. So by my, uh, what I have on the screen with my threads on translation on Twitter, some of them are doing a version of that, of just sort of looking at a line from the Odyssey as translated by five or 10 different people, usually including me, and just seeing how they're all different from each other and exploring 
what's at stake and the differences. And I usually when I do that, I find out something I hadn't realized. I mean, I'm not always sort of deciding I'm going to be different in some specific way. I, I'm just trying to do whatever, whatever I can based on my best thinking about the Greek and the English language and the possibilities that might be there. Um, so okay, so lots more questions. So let me see what else there is. Uh, I, I should go through, right? Is that right? Okay. Well, if, if, you, if you don't mind, Emily, I'd like to I'd like to draw your attention to 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 a few of these. And may I ask you to stop sharing your screen so that um, Ooh, yes, uh, yes, sorry, yes, you in greater relief. <laughs> yes, sorry, right. that was beautiful. Thank you. There we go. You. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, this is a question uh, from from Liz. Uh, how would you explain presenti presentism and historicism in how we interpret these stories? So I would I would say that um, his, historicism is to do with an idea that the past is totally different from the present, and that the primary way to understand the past is through its pastness. Um, and maybe that's a sort of simplistic way of framing it, but um, historicism is to do with the, um, the sort of autonomy of different historical periods and their um, their absolute difference from the present. Uh, whereas presentism is about co-opting the past and saying it was all actually quite just the same as what we experience in today's culture, today's world. And clearly both of those are, I, I, I personally think both of those are in a sense wrong. I mean, in their starkest form, I think both of them are wrong. Um, I think I mean, I'm in some ways a, a historian of culture and literature, and I do I, I incline more to some version of historicism, but I, I guess I just wanted to, to flag that I think there are versions of historicism that are more useful than others, and there are versions of historicism that are kind of false, if you're suggesting that I can get to the past in itself and the way that my journey to getting to that isn't itself going to be informed by the present. I think the way that historicism itself is a product of modernity. People in, in antiquity were not historicists. They didn't think about historical periods in the way that modern historians do. Um, so I, I want to just try and complicate the idea that um, you can, you can through respect, the respect for history means somehow teleporting back into history. I don't think that's a possible thing to do. So insofar as we care about being responsible and truthful about the differentness of the past, which I personally do very much want to be truthful about the differentness of the past, but that journey has to come about through an awareness of the present as well as the past. Um, oh. So we, we, have, we, have so, we have so many uh, questions on here. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of drawn to some of them that are, that are really sort of textual. And there's this one very simple question here I'd like to, I, I'd like to advance. Did the suitors need to die? From Bonnie. Uh, that's a great question, right? <laughs> uh, yes, I love that question. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough question, right? I mean, we have particular, I think there's different questions because one question is, does the particular, does, remember there's the scene with the single suitor who's a good suitor. Among the suitors, there's one guy who says, oh, I think we've actually been going too far with this. Shouldn't we just leave? And Athena ensures that he stays. He's going to get massacred along with the others. So I think that also helps to complicate the idea that they're all evil, they all have to die. The narrative doesn't want us to think they're all evil because at least one of them tried to get away and tried to say sorry, he died along with the others. Um, was there a way for Odysseus to get his absolute um, old home, home, old social position back without slaughtering them? I'm not sure. But I think the poem is also sort of asking us to, to think about um, what other choices did he have was that the only place he could be? Was that the only possible home? It clearly wasn't. He's actually at home in many different places. We see the other narrative possibilities, right? We, we first meet Odysseus when he's making what Calypso sees as a really weird choice. He could have been a mortal. He could have stayed at home on the island with Calypso forever. It's only because he, he's, for, for reasons he never fully explains, I think it's a very resonant absence, he wants to go back home, despite the fact that he has the chance of immortality, he has the chance of being with an immortal beautiful goddess forever in luxury, and yet he wants to go home. And one could say there's something very beautiful about that, it's his home place, one can also say, and I don't think this is in contradiction, it's to do with his status, that he can only be the top man, the most important person in his world, if he's in Ithaca, in no other place is he the, is he the most important. If you think Odysseus being important is the most important thing, then yes, they have to die. If you don't think that, then he could have married Nausicaa. 
and he could have stayed with the Phaeacians. And he got, got along just fine with the Phaeacians. That was another possible home. There were many other places he could have been. But once he's in Ithaca, I think it's, uh, it's him or them. Um, so, um, uh, another uh, question. I, 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 I'm just sort of advancing these, these, these sort of very um, succinct questions. I, I, I'd love to hear you. From start to finish, how did translating the Odyssey change your personal outlook on life? Oh, wow, life. <laughs> that's, that's a big one. Ah, gosh, I mean, it's, it's so hard to, to disentangle, right? I mean, the Odyssey and the Iliad have been, you know, important parts of my life for a very long time. Um, even before I, and I, I didn't, you know, early in my career, I always, I always love these poems, as I said, since I was eight years old, but also ever since I started um, reading them in Greek, I've always loved them. And they've always been a part of my life. So it's sort of hard to disentangle when did the how did the translation process itself change as it changed me as opposed to living with Homer for all these decades. Um, I mean, I think the, the process of both doing the translation and then talking about the translation to, to audiences like this has, has definitely changed me. And in a way, it's changed just my awareness of, um, of just, I mean, the, the issues that I was talking about a little bit of, um, of myself as somebody who, I'm a green card holder, I'm not a citizen of the United States, but I live here and this is my home. Um, I think it's in, in some maybe hard to articulate sort of ways, the Odyssey seems to me to speak to that question of where, where exactly is the place of belonging and also is the place of belonging, is my having a belonging place somehow inherently violent? Am I doing something violent in living in the kind of privilege that I live in? I think my, my sense of that is different because I've spent so much time thinking about Odysseus's Nostos. I mean, I think I would have a sense of my white privilege anyway, but the framework that I use to think about that is different because I think of it in terms, not just of those modern terms, but also in terms of Homer's narrative terms. This is, this is a question that, that I think is, is, is related in parts of the, to, what, to what you just said um, from uh, uh, M Melissa, uh, your, uh, Dr. Wilson, your passion is inspirational. Thank you. Do you think that the Homeric poems address the question of whether empathy can be learned or taught? That's such a great question. I mean, I, I, I kind of wish that, um, that, that, you know, as somebody who loves literature and I, you know, I teach literature, I write about literature, I love poems and I love stories. And I wish I was sort of fully believed that um, reading poetry can teach people to be better people. Um, and that, that the experience of imaginatively engaging with other perspectives does that make you capable of understanding other people and empathizing with other people in a different way? I'm, you know, I, I will love that idea. And I also, partly because I, I know that I have a vested interest in that idea, I therefore am skeptical of it. I'm not sure whether empathy can be learned or taught. I mean, I think this also gets to the previous question of how do we disentangle all the different things that happen in our lives, including our experiences of reading? Is it separate or is it all part of the same thing? I'm living in the poem as well as living in Philadelphia. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I also, I, I think, I think my, my account of empathy in Homer was maybe quite short and, I guess part of what I love about the depictions of human connection in Homer is that I think there's a, in a way, sort of stark recognition that there's a limit to empathy. There's a limit to how much people seem to be able to feel for each other as opposed to themselves. They feel together, but is that actually for each other? Um, Penelope's crying, but is she crying for herself or for her lost husband? Um, Odyssey, Achilles and Priam at the end of the Iliad, they cry together and it's a moment of connection, but is it actually a moment of empathy? I'm not sure that it is. I think it's a moment of, they both are, they both are grieving, but they're grieving for different things. So that, what does that teach? Maybe it teaches us something about the limits of human, human beings, as well as about the, like that dream of, if only we could be more empathetic, if only we could feel for everybody in the way that we can feel for the people in our family. I suppose need, one needs to be open to receiving the lesson if you're actually going to be productively yeah. taught, yeah. Right, right, yeah. Um, a question here from Damon. Are there any works written in your lifetime that you think might be considered classical literature in thousands of years, similar to the way that Homer is now? Oh, it's such a, I mean, 
I hope that there are, you know, I hope, hope human culture exists in thousands of years and that we haven't destroyed it with climate change, but I actually very much doubt it. Um, maybe that's a, a dark answer. I mean, I think there's a lot of wonderful literature being produced right now. I think it's a great time for, for writing and writers. Um, I was a judge on the Brooker Prize last year and it was really inspiring to me to see how many great novels are being written right now. Um, and I mean, it's, I think it's impossible for people at the time to know which ones are going to resonate in a thousand, in a thousand or even a hundred years, because it depends on how, cult, how what culture is in a thousand or a hundred years. But I think we're some fantastic living writers for sure. Um, I mean, I guess I'm thinking about one of my favorite writers is Jasmine Ward, who wrote Salvage the Bones. Um, and I think I, I, I would I would love to you know see her work endure and be read in you know five hundred years. It'd be great. Right. Um, I'm trying to group some of these, but they're hard oh, no. <laughs> to do it yes. in real to, to, to do it I in real time. I wish, I wish I would have stopped sooner because there's so many great questions. I love um, it. Uh, well, let's see. Um, uh, maybe, maybe this question on on, on translation. Uh, ah, yeah. This, um, this is from Marcus. Um, uh, when you are translating Homer, what is your source for the Greek text? And what is the history of how that has been transmitted to us? So the primary source that I use is a modern edition. I use the Oxford classical text, in fact I can... So I use... Um... I use the Oxford classical text um, and then I look at other editions and I look at commentaries as well, but I look, I use um, the this modern edition and as you can see this is um i hope you can see this maybe um people who don't um who haven't looked at my light's bad um if you haven't looked at classical text before but what this has is an apparatus it's called an apparatus criticus at the bottom which tells you um so the bottom part is the poem and then there's the bottom part which tells you different manuscript readings from different um manuscripts of the text. Uh, the run, of course, there's no sort of handwritten Odyssey by Homer from the 8th century. We don't have any text from as early as that. The earliest um, sort of editions of Homer were happening in Alexandria. You've probably heard of the Library of Alexandria. One of the big things the librarians of Alexandria were doing was collating um, texts that were by then canonical within Greek literature, including the Homeric poems, and debating with one another about should this line go in there, should that line go in there. So all modern editions are based on the editions produced by the librarians in Alexandria in the 3rd, 2nd century BCE. Um, so whichever modern text I choose, whether it's the Tumna or the OCT, that it's going to be based on that. So that so that so um, we don't we also don't have beyond papyrus scraps the editions of those Alexandrian scholars, but we have a lot of evidence about what they did and what they uh, how the, how they read Homer, and then later manuscripts um, that we do have the medieval or Byzantine manuscripts are based on those are both based ultimately through a long process of copying on those Alexandrian editions. But I mean, there's a there's a longer question, which has, well, there's another question, which has to do with how did the Homeric poems go from being based on a long oral tradition to being written texts in themselves, which is a separate question from how did the written poems become the printed poems. I see there's lots of questions, which I oh, it'll be hard to get to all of them. Let's, let's keep trying, I guess. So should I should I try and choose one or should or do you want to please please, please please do I I, I, I don't want to be too much of a here. <laughs> yes uh, it's so tough isn't it if there's one that stands out to you you can go for it um uh, well, somebody whose girls are five and seven my my um 11 year old loves the um graphic novel versions of the olympia which are graphic novel books about the olympian gods um and she actually on, only reads the ones about the goddesses because she doesn't not that interested in gods. There are, there are a lot of really great um, versions for kids. My daughters have no interest in the Iliad because it's too sad because people kill each other, which I think is a legitimate response. Um, but there are many, if, if your kids have different tastes about violence, there are many possibilities out there, including for the Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, and, and uh, yeah. Partly because of my own kids' preferences, I, I know more about the graphic novel world than world of them um, than the chapter book questions. I think there's some pretty good ones for both. 
Um, what, else, what else is there? What else, do you want to suggest another one? Sure. Well, there are there are a number of questions. There's some questions here in the in the chat too, rather than the Q and A. Um, uh, but I, I, there, there are a couple questions in the Q and A and in the chat along the lines of the classics, uh, like what are the classics? Um, one question: uh, uh, How do you respond to current criticisms of, criticisms of whether or not or how to teach the classics, particularly those claiming that the area of study, as it is often taught, serves to reinforce white supremacist rhetoric? Yeah, so I mean, I know that you guys had um, Danelle Peralta come to talk last year, right? And he, the, there was a great New York Times piece about his work um, a few weeks ago. I think he's done a lot of good for the field. I mean, I, I also think he, along, along with many, many other, other people within classics, are asking really good questions, which you know, are absolutely necessary for the field to engage with, both about the whiteness of classics departments and also about the shapes of the the way that we define um, and study different ancient cultures um, and th that in a way there are there are issues which I think are actually productive to talk about in the classroom as well as in scholarship about why why are we looking at ancient Greece without also looking at the ancient Near East these cultures interacting with, with each other How, why aren't we looking at ancient Greece and ancient Egypt and ancient Phoenicia together the, there's multiculturalism happening in the ancient world there are lots of really interesting and productive studies that we can do about that I also think classics is a, is a um, as, I, as I think Professor Peralta would, would probably also say, I think classics is a great locus for just discussing white supremacy and whiteness and the formations of modern racism, because it's such a central um, discipline within that, within the modern um, academy. I and mean, if you can discuss it in a way that doesn't reinforce it, I think it's extremely productive to discuss ancient texts and also modern receptions to them in ways that um, enable a discussion about um, racism as well as ethnocentrism and canonicity and how those things are implicated with modern forms of bias in a way that can be a really productive both classroom and scholarly dialogue. I think it's great that we're at this moment in the within the discipline, but also in the public discourse about the discipline. I mean, I think there've been way too many op-ed pieces sort of saying, oh no, everyone's burning down the classics, which is not actually true at all. I think it's it's a sign of life in a in a field of study, if it's being self-questioning and really thinking about what are the premises and what do we want to keep, what do we want to throw out, what are the, the big questions? As, as you guys always talk about the big questions, this, this is one of the big questions that's there pretty much in every humanities subject and very intensely right now in classics. I think it's great that we're having these conversations. And probably more people are talking about the classics now than they ever have. And... <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't want them to, to be talking about it in a way that says, um, you know, Oh no, the classics is bad because now, now I mean, I think I think some some of the discourse about the classics is just not helpful if it's sort of saying woke professors are trying to destroy it and we're we're going to defend it. I mean, I just don't think that that's at all accurate. Um, I think that the the liveliness of the classics and also of humanities in general is to do with you know creating engagement, and that has to do with asking hard questions about us as well as ancient cultures. Uh, there's a, a question here uh, in the in the chat, uh, moving sort of back into into translation. Um, how many different words are used in these works that don't have words, e English equivalent words, and how yes. does reading and translating overall differ from translating word by word? <laughs> yes. Um I mean, I don't know if the questioner has any other language, but it seems to me that no, that there's almost never an exact 100% equivalence. Even when there's a word that's borrowed from one language to another, its connotations in the, in the language during the borrowing are different. Um, I mean, even if we, so, I mean, I, I'm sure you, I'm sure people who are bilingual in Spanish, I mean, presumably this is Texas, you, might, you guys must have some people who know Spanish very well, even if you think about that, there's no exact equivalent, right? I mean, the way you, even the way you say hello, or even the way you sing happy birthday, it's different in Spanish. There are different words. There's no, if you translate happy birthday in a word for word way, you don't have a song. Um, so, I mean, I would say pretty close to 100% in terms of the words. I mean, if you even think about, you know, basic words like um, husband or man, in Greek, that's the same word. So it makes a difference that there's a distinction between man versus human being versus in English where we have man, human being and husband as distinct words. The whole shape of how do you divide up reality is different in every language. Um, 
I mean, even and then I mean, in the, in working on the Iliad, I'm sort of constantly thinking there aren't enough words for particular kinds of sound and words for particular kinds of glitteriness or shininess. The whole color vocabulary is different. The whole psychological vocabulary is different. When you have a feeling in Homer, it's described with body parts, which we don't have. So for instance, a Homeric person has a thumos, which is somehow the chest area, but that's also the root of your self-confidence. And we don't, we don't imagine the self in the same way. So how do you translate that? I mean, there's no obvious answer to, there's no right answer to that. There's no such thing as the literal translation, which you then jazz up with some poetry. It's that, that there isn't an equivalent. So you have to do something which creates an equivalent experience, whatever that is. Yeah, that, 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 that's fascinating. The, the, the feeling is centered in a part of your body. We don't think about the feeling. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, we don't actually have that's that really part cool. of the body. Yeah, it's, yeah it, you know, we don't even have yeah. that part anymore. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. we have bodies, and of course their bodies must have looked yeah. the same as ours, but they didn't divide the bodies out the same way. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for instance, this is, my, this is my care. This is my whole, this whole thing is my care. Right. The, 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 the distinction between the hand and the arm isn't there in home. Wow. You know, that, that kind of thing, you know, really it, cool. it's concrete as well as, as well as metaphysical. I think people sometimes think ju it's just about values that are hard to translate, and that's not true. It's about pretty much everything. I mean, it's, it's like it gives us access to an alien world that's also incredibly familiar. Absolutely, uh, yes. That's, that's yeah. very, that's, that's, yeah. That's, I mean, I would strongly, as well as reading lots of literature from non Anglophone cultures in translation, I strongly encourage people to learn a language if you don't. It's just even a little bit of language learning gives you that access to another way of dividing up the world. Uh, a question here from Mia. Uh, in my reading of your translation, I absolutely love the ways that you avoided what other translators historically have done and either uh, to center elite male perspectives. As long as the alphabet has existed, as long as written and oral language has existed, has it always existed to serve as a weapon for reinforcing, for enforcing power structures? Is it always doomed to do so? Ooh, that's, that, that is a hard question. I mean, Maybe we can take some inspiration from the ancient Akkadians, right? So the, the earliest um, poet that we know of was a woman. Um, so in, within the Akkadian tradition, before the, before the Greek tradition, the Akkadian tradition clearly centered, or at least included, um, female poet voices. Um, has language always existed to center men and to center privilege? I don't know. I mean, every culture that I know of, there's there's inequality and the and gender inequality is part of every culture that I know about. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure if that means there can't be any progress. I mean, that we have seen progress. At least I, I feel like I've seen progress even in my lifetime, of some kind or other. It's not like we're anywhere near all the way there. Um, that was a big question. I'm not sure if I can fully answer it, but it's a great question. I'm glad people are thinking about that. And I'm glad people are thinking also just about the relationship of language to um, structures of power, because I think that's sometimes neglected as, and it's so obvious that structures of power are to do with politics and economic forces, which they certainly are, but they're also about language and stories that we tell. Maybe we can tell different stories, but also think about the stories we do have differently. All right. Do you see anything particular that jumps up? I mean, I'm looking through the questions, I'm, thinking, I'm noticing that Timothy Welsh also asked about um, gender and talking about female gods and male gods. Um, gender inequality is also present in the divine world. Um, yes, that's that's a um, which I think is is part of this part of the same cluster of questions. Um, I mean, I th one of the things that I think is interesting also is that, yes, Calypso has that um, outraged speech in which she suggests it's so unfair because male gods get to do whatever they want with human beings, whereas she doesn't get to abuse the human being she wants to abuse. Um, but that we also have an, a picture in the Odyssey of um, Athena getting absolutely everything she wants. Um, and similarly, in the Iliad, we have both the depiction of Aphrodite, who's a very much a gendered as female goddess, her vulnerability in being literally wounded um, is sort of partly to do with her being sort of girly and seductive. Um, but then we also see the power and aggression of Hera and Athena, who are constantly um, grappling against the plans of Zeus. 
I mean, I think we certainly see in the Homeric poems gender struggle being there in Olympus and in the human plane and among the enslaved people as well as the elites, but that they're experienced differently in each of these communities. I mean, I think that obviously the concept of intersectionality, the concept of the way that um, economic power, racial power, gender power, these are separate categories, even though they also can overlap and intersect. That's not a concept which Homer had, but it's, it's something which you can absolutely see clearly in the Homeric story world. There's an, there's an awareness that um, the power of a goddess far outstrips the power of an enslaved mortal man. Um, even though, of course, we also see the dominance of patriarchal use over the goddesses. Uh, a question from Melinda, uh, who like a recommendation uh, for uh, reading more about learning about the Greeks. So I've, I've enjoyed reading your translation and would like to read a history of the Greeks. What do you recommend? Oh, no, I wish I wish I had a better answer to that. I'm not sure what to recommend. I mean, I, mean, I wish I wish there was a better sort of um, introduction for the non specialist reader that I actually know about. I'm not sure that I know of a really good recent um, history of the ancient Greeks. Um, I mean, there are several popular ones. I mean, I think I might recommend an anthology rather than a narrative history, because I think the, the narrative histories, um, I mean, it probably depends which particular period you want. I mean, there are several pretty good books about the Mycenaeans and the culture that the Homeric poems are partly drawing on. And then there are different histories of fifth century Greeks. So of course, it's a different culture from the culture of Homer. Um, but I think I might recommend starting with just a, a, there are several sort of compilation anthologies of different sources so that you can get your own um, sense of the different voices of different authors before you'd read a narrative history. Or even start with you know, one of the ancient historians themselves. I mean, Herodotus is really fun to read. And Herodotus gives a sense of at least a part of Greek history in, in his account of the wars between the um, the Greeks and the Persians, and also the interactions between Greek speakers and the ancient Near East, which is part of what Herodotus' history is about. And it has a great book about Egypt as well, mostly made up. <laughs> <laughs> the best books are. Yeah. <laughs> like Odyssey, yes. <laughs> uh, Grant has a question. Uh, although community colleges often have large general humanities, humanities surveys, as we do at ACC, there's often not a good specific starting point for students interested in pursuing study in classics in two-year programs. What do you think needs to happen in the discipline or in higher education to make it more accessible and available as an educational path for students coming out of community colleges? That is such a good question. And, and I wish I had a better answer to that. I mean, I feel like I, I would need to do more research because I've never taught in a community college. Um, and so I feel like my, I mean, I've, in fact, we just had a speaker at Penn come and talk to us about um, teaching history at community college. And um, I felt like I learned a lot from her about just um, the particular environments and the particular things that are possible pedagogically in community college that are different from what's possible in a, um, in a four year university like Penn. Um, I mean, I think there needs to be more funding for summer study, I think, that, and bridge programs. Um, I mean, I think for a lot of students coming from community college and also for students coming um, you know, as first generation um, or from low income backgrounds to, to any college, but especially to the fancier kinds of college, I think there needs to be more support. I mean, you know, most, most four year colleges now have some kind of like on ramp bridge program, but I think there needs to be more that's sort of tailored to particular interests in the major. Um, I mean, it, obviously there's different ways of studying classics and different paths to it. Um, I mean, a, a pen like many, a, a, like many you know, big four-year colleges, you know, we have different tracks within the classics major, some of which are language oriented, some of which aren't. I mean, you can be a classics major at a four-year college without learning Latin or Greek. And that's a perfectly valid, good way of engaging with the subject. Not everybody needs to have been reading Latin for years and years in order to engage with the literature and the culture on a really deep level. Um, but I think there needs to be more support for people coming from different backgrounds and more, I guess, more mentoring, but also ideally more, more money. We also have a post back program at Penn and there are several other post back programs around the country, which I think are also a way of just making the be a better bridge from people who, who are interested in doing classics PhD or MA, but don't have the background to be ready to do that. So post back programs are a possible bridge for making that possible. For, 
doing doing language if you haven't studied the languages or getting better at the languages if you haven't had the opportunity to do that. This is a very related question from an aspiring classicist at Concordia University who wants to know what advice you might have for uh, uh, people who would like to learn uh, classical languages uh, and advice in general for aspiring classicists. Yeah, that's that's, that's a great question. I, mean, I, I do think that, I mean, obviously, if you want to learn the languages, I think it's very hard to self teach. Um, I mean, people do manage it, but I think it's extremely difficult. There are lots and lots of um, summer programs. And I mean, I guess one of the big issues about that is, as I was kind of saying, is that I wish there was more funding available for more of those summer programs. Um, there, but there are a lot of really great summer programs out there. Um, there are also sort of study abroad programs, but especially if you want to learn the languages, um, there's a famous um, intensive summer i think summer in greek program in in new york um, there are lots of colleges around the country which offer summer language to, um, learning opportunities so i think if you can get funding to do that in some way that's a great way to do it there are also i mean for, there are a lot there are lots of you know MOOCs and online classes available i mean youtube lectures that kind of thing are possible um also but i think those are those are potentially harder to to, it's harder to use those for language learning than for more cultural and historical knowledge, I, I, I think. Um, yeah, I, I wish I wish I had better advice. I mean, I wish I wish I also just had more sense of, um, you know, how exactly do people pay for this? I think that's one of the big, big um, obstacles to to any specialist field is that it takes a particular um, investment of time to learn ancient Greek really well. And you, you probably need some kind of funding to get that to make that happen. Um, I mean, there, there are funding sources, but I think it's, I think it's hard potentially. Uh, maybe we can go back to uh, some of the textual questions. Yeah. Um, Anonymous wants to know um, why the servants needed to die. Uh, oh, I, mean, I suppose we could reframe <laughs> this. Did the servants need to die? <laughs> And, yes. and, well, and of course, not servants, but but slaves. I mean, it is one of the one of the one of the uh, 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 one of the, the powerful things about your translation is that you don't shy away from that. I mean, do you, you, yeah. you use the term. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that they're enslaved people, not servants, it's not um, that it's a servant problem as if it was, you know, Downton Abbey. It's it's it really is um, that these are people who have no home of their own, who are claimed as as if they were property. And that what happens in book 22 is that Odysseus lays sort of violent claim to his own home by slaughtering those who come into his home uninvited. And then he directs the enslaved women to clean up the furniture from all the gore that's got spattered from the dead bodies. And then the, the enslaved women who've been um, claimed by the dead suitors um, are themselves treated as like bespattered furniture that they are also the, the cleaning women are also stuff that needs to get cleaned up um, I mean I think it matters that Odysseus doesn't um, treat the enslaved people the same way as the elite warriors who are his opponents the, the suitors who have their own swords instead they are, he delegates those killings and those killings are represented as very different in kind and different in motivation from the killing of the suitors who've chosen to be there the enslaved people haven't chosen to be there. Odysseus says at the start of book 22 that the suit accuses the suitors of raping the enslaved women. So it's not as if the poem is sort of unambiguously saying it's their fault. I think it's certainly not saying that, it's certainly not un un unambiguously. I think it's instead suggesting because the suitors have laid claim to both these 12 women and the one man, Melanthius, therefore they belong to, in some way to men who aren't Telemachus and Odysseus. And in order for Odysseus to have absolute control over, this is all my stuff, he has to eradicate the stuff which has memories. And human stuff has memories because in fact they're human beings. So I think it's in order to not have the shame of, there are people here who remember that it wasn't always yours, it doesn't fully belong to you. That's shameful. And so in order for that not to happen, Telemachus um, is delegated to um, to kill these these 13 people. He's told to hack the life out of the women with swords, but instead he chooses to to hang them all with a rope the, with the women. And then he has the even, in, in some ways, even more grisly um, cutting off of the limbs of Melanthius. I think it's sort of a, a way of saying there's a, there are different functions to um, 
women who are enslaved versus men who are enslaved, that the, the man who's enslaved, his limbs are supposed to work for, for the enslaver, and the, the, therefore, therefore they get cut off. Whereas the woman who's enslaved, it's, it's, it's her orifices, it's her, her, the internal parts of her body are supposed to belong to one man. If they don't belong to that man anymore, he's gonna destroy. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think it says very good things about the culture, but I also think it's very, very vividly, and I think it's described in terms that make it clear um, both that the enslaved people have their own perspectives, their own motivations, um, and that also you can you can see why Odysseus feels the need to do this, and also why Telemachus feels the need to do this, which is different from why his father feels the need to do this. So there's this re really subtle differences of characterization in the different perspectives. So I'm not sure if that says why they need. I, mean, I think the other the, the other possible answer is they need to die in terms of the narrative because it cuts off the possibility or it precludes the possibility of but couldn't Penelope go and sleep with someone else? Symbolically, this says all the women in the house either belong to Odysseus or they're dead. So I think it's a way of sort of saying any possibility of woman, woman who belonged to another man is gone. I, I appreciated your interpretation too of the of the birds caught in caught in the net that, that they're they're sort of seeking a homecoming that that's thwarted in the context yeah. of this of Odysseus's homecoming too. Yeah. I thought I thought that was a um, that, that, that was very, very interesting. <laughs> um, uh, a, a question here um, uh, from 99702, um, uh, or 7002. How would you explain the relationship the Greeks had with mythology versus reality? How did they differentiate between the two? Or did they see mythology as their truth and their history? This is a great question, yes. I mean, the category of mythology, of course, is a, you know, Part of the modern curriculum. Um, I mean, I think if you'd asked um, Plato or Herodotus, they would have said the stories about the gods are, um, they're part of our religion as much as part of our history, but they're part of both. They're part of the way we structure and uh, structure education and beliefs about the world. But it's also not the case that there's no evidence in, um, in at least in, in fifth century culture of, um, of Greeks, at least Athenians, questioning these stories, right? I mean, there were several moments in the plays of Euripides where characters say, there are all these stupid stories out there about the gods, but I don't believe any of it. And people in Plato certainly interrogate these stories about the gods and say, actually, they've got the gods all wrong. The gods are not like that. The gods are not always fighting each other and having affairs and being jealous and getting upset all the time. That's not the way we should be thinking about religion. Um, so it's positive, within this culture, these stories were both um, absolutely formative for people from, from childhood up as a way of thinking about the world. I mean, the closest thing to the Hebrew Bible within ancient Greek culture is the Homeric poems. Um, but then I think one could also question in our culture, how, much, how literally do different people believe in Genesis? There's a whole range. And presumably, I, th I think in, in ancient and archaic Greek, Greek cultures, I suspect there was a whole range in terms of how, how how literally are you going to take these stories? The fact that there were many different variations on particular myths, I think also tells you something about the particular particular ways that they um, both believed and didn't believe, or there were different possibilities. Um, so that um, you know, one one could both think um, this is sort of true, but then I could I could change the story and make it better. So it's a possible it's, it's a possible way of um, a play, it's, a, it's an imaginative world as well as a theological world. Um, may, maybe just the final thing on that is that, of course, it's actually very different from the Hebrew Bible and different from the Quran in that there was no sacred text. The Homeric poems are based on oral tradition, um, even though by the time of Alexandria, the Homeric poems were special compared to other um, dactylic hexameter poems from the mythological tradition. They, were, they weren't imagined as literally everything in Homer is never going to be played differently. If you read any Athenian tragedy, they very often return to the same stories, but they do different things with it. Sophocles was probably the one who made up the story of Oedipus blinding himself. But there was this possibility of you know, fanfic about um, mythology, which isn't necessarily going to give the same twists on the stories that were there in the previous version. There's a question here about uh, Xenia. In terms of Xenia and the threat of being eaten up by other cultures, where does Odysseus's sojourn on Circe's island fit in? The willingness to stay elsewhere voluntarily. Is this also a kind of threat? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that on that in um, in book five, when we when Menelius begins his journey and um, finally Calypso is persuaded to um, Calypso is persuaded to, to let Odysseus leave. Um, we're told that he no longer wants to be there, which of course implies that at some stage or other he did want to be there. But that it was not that for all of that seven years it's been involuntary, even though by the time we meet him at that point in the narrative, it's late on in the narrative, by that time he wants to go. Um, how, I'm not sure exactly how it fits in. I mean, I think it's the poem is sort of playing around with diff variations on the trope of, um, of, of, of Zania, of cultural assimilation, of cultural change, cultural difference, and on um, how much is missing from a hospitality if there is no um, sending off. So, so the feeding, the, the offering drink, the offering shelter, the sharing of stories, the entertainment, those are all features of a good guest, guest host experience. And then the final feature is supposed to be, you give help with the onward journey. You give what in Greek is called pompe or sending. That's the only element that Calypso doesn't give until Hermes twists her arm and talks her into it. So I think it's to do with um, an idea not 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 of in the, within the Calypso episode of being swallowed up, but of being trapped there, of being it's great here, but you actually there's no way out. So that in itself makes it maybe a little bit less great if you can't come and go as you might want to. Um, if I may, I just I, I'd like to ask a follow up question on that. I, I, you you mentioned in your talk uh, that that you thought Xenia may be an inspiring ideal for modern nations. I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit. Well, that's because, of course, there's so much um, sort of debating in, in modern country, in modern countries. I think pretty much every modern culture has some kind of issue with um, with immigration and with refugees. Um, so, I mean, in a way, the Homeric poems, especially the Odyssey, present these journeys by individuals who show up in need at a person's at an elite person's house and need to be taken in, offered food and shelter, and even before they've um, said who they are, they're taken in. The norm of Xenia is you don't question somebody first. First, you take them in. The asking questions is later. Um, and of course, there's something there's something starkly different about encountering that pattern when we're so used to reading the newspaper about what is it like to be you know, somebody coming from Mexico or from Central America or South America. You get questioned first, and you don't get off at the, the food and shelter first. You get the questions, and then it's un absolutely unknown whether you even get to um, get anywhere near the, the building of a relationship, which is part of what's at the heart of Xenia. And so I think it's also just that the way that Xenia is, is imagined in the, in, in the Odyssey is to do with an, an idea that it's to your advantage to take somebody in, because that's going to increase your network. It's going to mean that when you, if you're ever on a trip and you might want to gather goods and, and get gifts, then it's going to be great if you have lots of places to stay. You know, in a pre-Airbnb world, you want to have lots of people who can take you in. But there's, of course, I mean, within the modern world, even beyond the trivia of Airbnb, it's actually good to have strong international diplomacy. It's good to have strong relationships between countries. And part of that hinges on whether there are, like, what degree of open borders or what degree of, like, what, what, what kind of immig immigration policy do diff different countries have. Um, and I think we can see that in diff playing out in different ways in different parts of the modern world. I mean, there's different kinds of pressure on European countries with, with the European refugee crisis versus in the United States, where I think the sort of privilege in this country, in the, at least in the center of the country, less so in Texas, because you can be further away from the border, whereas in every European country, you're not, you're not far away from the border. The border is, is everywhere. Thank you. All right. Um, do you see anything here that you would particularly like to like to address? There are some that we've sort of discussed that speak to sort of general themes. Um, uh, I, I can quickly talk about the, the process one. Um, I write, I tend to write by hand first. I usually use a notebook and I do a lot of like, reading out loud of the original. And then I 
so I sort of read it, read it multiple times out loud to myself, like a particular passage, just to try and get make sure I've got a sense of the sound of it. I usually then like read a couple of different commentaries on the, on a particular passage, and then I read it out loud again, and then I do a first draft of a particular passage by hand, and then I usually do it by screen after that. Um, and I usually do I do I do huge amounts of um, revision at, at every stage of the process. I like doing a first draft by hand because I can do crossing out, but then also see what I crossed out because very often what I crossed out was better than what I then come up with, or there's something I can that I, I change my mind about how exactly am I going to do this. Um, so I, I do multiple multiple different drafts, but I, I usually have a stage of, of writing by hand first and then onto the screen. All right. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, this has uh, been been a real treat to uh, be able to to talk with you and, and to and to hear you speak and and to and to model for us how to engage uh, with these with these ancient texts. Um, uh, we, we we truly we truly appreciate your your, your presence uh, with us uh, the, this morning, and we look forward to uh, continually in, uh, to continuing to engage with you in the future. I'm sorry about my talk. Oh, it's fine. She's like, wow, please thank you for all. <laughs> it was so nice to, to meet you and to meet all of you. And I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get to get to all the questions, but they were wonderful questions. Thank you so much for your attentive work with, with this poem. And I, and I wish all of you all the best with your continuing studies. It's wonderful to meet you all.